Hello, Remix 16. We're here on location, and the purpose is, is to start off by talking about our upcoming assignment, which is linked to another assignment that'll be due later on. This is for Dreams Worthy of Our Lord. And I'm out here on Notre Dame's campus, and so I'll just kind of do a little sweep and even turn my camera around so you can see better. So you see the recreation of the log chapel there. We have one of the lakes and then kind of continuing to sweep over we'll have the little basilica and the golden dome but where i'm standing right now there's a plaque that commemorates the letter that father edward soren the founder of the university of notre dame wrote to the head of the congregation of holy cross basil moreau and in this letter this is where father soren says to Blessed Moreau, if you'll permit me, dear Father, to share with you a preoccupation which gives me no rest. Briefly, it is this. Notre Dame du Lac was given to us by the bishop only on condition that we establish here a college at the earliest opportunity, as there is no other school within more than a hundred miles. This college cannot fail to succeed. Before long, it will develop on a large scale. It will be one of the most powerful means for good in this country. And this was written on December 5th, 1842. So less than a month after Father Soren and his companions came to the ground and looked over at probably a very similar landscape, a snow-covered field and, and lake and declared these words. And so we offer that to you, Remick, maybe inspiration for the work that you'll do and the dream that is in your heart for Catholic education that has been put there by the Holy Spirit. So look forward to getting a first attempt at that, for getting your first go at, at putting into words, again, the wonderful dream that is of Jesus Christ that is on your heart to make manifest in our world. Stay tuned for the tutorial. All right, Remix 16. So we're back inside and we will dive into the tutorial for this week for the document called The Religious Dimension of Education in a Catholic School Guidelines for Reflection and Renewal. This was written by the Congregation for Catholic Education, renamed from the Sacred Congregation for Catholic Education, same body, but just a different name. And this is from 1988. So let's talk a little bit about what we're gonna find in this document and, and what it's all about. So this document is gonna pick up the mantle that's been left by thus far the other documents from the congregation for catholic education or its former name the sacred congregation for catholic education so obviously gravissimo like educaciones from 1965 and, and that being just the the main document that all these other documents are going to try to unpack and we've seen that thus far the catholic school so the follow-up to gravissimo where instead of a, a really broad look at catholic education the catholic school obviously focusing in on its namesake Catholic schools versus catechesis programs versus even university level, and then lay Catholics in schools focusing in on a very specific population and the laity being a, a, an explicit focus in the, that 1982 document. But this one from 1988, the religious dimension of education in a Catholic school is going to restrict once again its attention to Catholic schools, so all pre-university levels, and it's going to focus in on the religious dimension. And so it's worth kind of considering, and as you read through it, to continue to, to try to answer this question, what is meant by the term religious? So why does the congregation decide to use the term religious as opposed to maybe the faith dimension or the spiritual dimension? So I pose that as a question for your own unpacking and, and analysis and just continued reflection as you continue to read and even as we go on throughout this tutorial. So to think about what is meant by the term religious. The composition of the document then. So gravissimum, as we said, I mean, it's the bedrock document for all of Catholic education. It has 13 references. 
So it's referenced 13 times. So you can see the heavy influence of Gravissimum on this document, the religious dimension of education in a Catholic school. And I have the, the paragraphs that are referenced there. And in fact, eight is bold and underlined because passage eight from Gravissimum is referenced five times in and of itself. And so we're gonna take a look at that in a very kind of specific way on the next slide. The Catholic school is referenced three times and you can see the passages that are mentioned based upon the Catholic school there. And then lay Catholics in schools, witnesses to faith is referenced three times as well. Really the one of those is just a mention of the document itself. So um, include that as a reference just because it is naming it. It's not really referencing as it does here, or at least going to the paragraphs that it references 56 through 59. And so highly encourage you as you're going through, there's not gonna be maybe as, as many direct quotes from these documents as maybe we've seen in the past, but they're definitely referenced. And you're gonna see in the footnotes and the end notes that you'll be able to link back to it. And so it might be a great idea to just kind of refresh yourself, to go back into your own matrix to see if you've captured some of these passages yourself. And, and again, to just kind of refresh what those passages entailed. So Gravissimum paragraph eight though is referenced five times in and of itself. And so I think it's worth mentioning and, and explicitly going through as we prepare to dive into this document. I'm just gonna read it and you can follow along. But its proper function, its being the Catholic school's function, is to create for the school community a special atmosphere animated by the gospel, spirit of freedom and charity, to help youth grow according to the new creatures that they were made through baptism as they developed their own personalities, and finally to order the whole of human culture to the news of salvation so that the knowledge the students gradually acquire of the world, life, and man or human is illumined by faith. And so this specific passage is really going to be maybe the most important one that we will go through for this document, the religious dimension, thinking about this special atmosphere that's animated by the gospel spirit of freedom and charity to create that within our schools, and then to help the youth grow according to this new creature that they've been made through baptism, that really being the end point. And so, again, this document is really going to be all about making this passage a reality. Scripture has a huge influence on this document. It is referenced 42 total times. 31 of those references are to gospel passages, and I have that as a very specific and explicit focus right now because what you'll notice as you read through is that there is a distinct emphasis on living out this passage from the Catholic school that says the Catholic school loses its purpose without constant reference to the gospel and frequent encounter with Christ. This specific passage from the Catholic school is not referenced explicitly or even implied. It's, it's not implicitly referenced either. But from what I can gather and from my multiple reads of this, this is really what this document is, is trying to do. It's trying to show a connection to the gospel and to create this frequent encounter with Christ within our Catholic schools. And then the final piece of kind of what is composed here, and this document really reminds me a lot of Divini Ilius Magistri. So if you remember our first church document on Catholic education written by Pius XI in 1929, Divini, that it was heavily um, influenced by the saints and by scripture and by other church teachings. And so you're going to find that in this document as well. And in fact, if you're to maybe kind of mirror the two or to hold the two of them up to one another, you're going to see that this document is, is going to be really similar in a lot of ways to Divini, um, while also then having the influence of Gravissimum and the Catholic school and lay Catholics in schools. And so what you'll see here, again, is this return to having holy, in this case, men, but men and women overall, the saints influence what it is that we're doing in today's church. And so you'll have St. Pope Paul the, the Sixth, St. Pope John Paul the Second, St. Thomas Aquinas referencing Summa Theologica, St. Blaise Pascal, Penseis, which is um, thoughts, um, his great work there. St. Augustine is referenced as well. And then I think this is worth noting that there's great purpose and intentionality for when this document was released. It was on April 7th, 1988, which is the feast of St. John 
Baptist de la Salle, who's the patron of teachers. And so, um, you know, his charism being invoked through this document as well. Some tips for your reading before we get into then just some ideas about what is happening in this document. The document is long, so it mirrors or it's, it's very similar to, to teach as Jesus did in that way. This is one of the longest documents that we're going to end up reading. But the language, just like to teach as Jesus did, it's very accessible. So it should be not an easy read because it's long, but it shouldn't be like Divini was where the language is somewhat archaic and it's it's written for a different time and and it's really hard for us to kind of get into this one is not that way it's very accessible it's just long and so I have here maybe a suggestion and, and obviously you need to make this your own but there's five main sections in addition to the introduction and then a conclusion and so maybe it's worth saying, you know what, you're going to tackle one of these sections over the course of obviously five days, or maybe you're going to break it up and say, I'm going to do the introduction in one, and then I'll do two and three, and then four and five, and then I'll finish up the, the next day with the conclusion. And so however it is that you want to break it up, if you want to read it all at one sitting, please feel free. Um, but again, it is long. And so thinking that maybe these sections, and this is going to be how we'll help um, offer a tutorial about what's going on in this document. Um, maybe it's a good way to say you can break this up into some manageable chunks over the course of five days to just read a section at a time. So um, with that, we're going to dive in then. So the first section is on the religious dimension in the lives of today's youth. And so it's going to start by focusing on a call to say you need to get the latest research on the youth today and, and what are the best practices, what does research tell us on how to approach and to educate youth uh, most successfully. And then it's also, remember this from Divini, the, the huge impact of the media on our young people and that they're going to need help in ordering and prioritizing the, the heavy influence of the media. It's also going to reference the problems that are faced by our youth today. And so you have a list there and then what they end up turning to in most cases because of these problems as opposed to turning to their faith. And that there's this absence of the true, the good, and the beautiful in the lives of our young people today. The second section goes into the religious dimension of the school climate. So moving from a focus on the religious dimension of youth today and, and the way that religion impacts them to now saying what's the religious dimension of the Catholic school climate. We might be able to consider, I don't know if this would be a direct correlation, but we might consider climate to mean culture. And so they define it here in, in the document the congregation does by saying it's the space, the time, the persons, the relationships, the teaching, the study, and then the various other activities that take place within the school. And if you remember that passage from Gravissimo that talked about creating that atmosphere, of, of the gospel spirit of freedom and charity. This document, The Religious Dimension of Education in a Catholic School, I, I think has one of the most beautiful ways of putting the type of climate that we need to create. And so this is from passage 25. From the first moment that a student sets foot in a Catholic school, he or she ought to have the impression of entering a new environment one illumined by the light of faith and having its own unique characteristics. That there should be something fundamentally different about just the atmosphere. The minute a student sets foot on our campus, they should know that they are in a special, sacred place. And so how do we create that? That's really kind of then the main question in moving forward. So continuing this, the religious dimension of the school climate. Teachers obviously have a huge influence, and we've seen that in the other documents leading up to this one. This one is going to continue with that same um, trend. There's a great distinction between institution and community, and the congregation is going to argue and, and really encourage that our schools become communities, not just see themselves as institutions. And there's this great line that we want to honor the theological concept of a community, hearkening the Trinity. If you remember back from our very, one of our very first units in this course last semester about engaging in that mystery that all relationships are sacred. So that theological concept over a sociolog sociological category. So we're not looking at it from just the, a social standpoint, but it's theological in nature, this idea of community that we need to proclaim the gospel. Again, this is gonna be a theme. If, if you go through and do a search find um, of the word gospel, I'm, I'm interested, I haven't done it myself, but how many times just even the word gospel will show up and then the references to all the gospel passages and promote total human formation. 
that that's really what our school climate needs to do. It needs to proclaim the gospel and then promote total human formation. And I love that last part because really what we're starting to develop is a Christian pedagogy, a, a Christian approach to education. And you're really going to get that laid out in some pretty distinct and concrete terms throughout this document. Paragraph 34, the Catholic school finds its true justification in the mission of the church. So evangelization and, and in that way, um, bringing the faith to individual people and, and bringing them to full life. And so also while doing that, offering salvation, bringing them to salvation, and then establishing the kingdom of God here on earth as well. It's based on an educational philosophy in, with, in which faith, culture, and life are brought into harmony. So if you remember from the last really two documents, there, there was this heavy emphasis that its task, the Catholic school says, that document from 1977, its task is fundamentally a synthesis of faith and culture and of um, faith and life and bringing all those three things, again, into a harmonious relationship. The charisms of religious orders are mentioned in paragraph 35, and I just bring that up because of our emphasis at the end of last semester on the charisms that have influenced us, and then the importance of the laity. So hearkening to lay Catholics in the schools, paragraphs 37 and 38. Once again, going back to that idea of the Trinity and this theological concept that collaboration is emphasized and it's put up as, as saying, this is really one of the primary ingredients that we need to tap into in order for us to have a recipe of success. So the more the members of the educational community develop a real willingness to collaborate among themselves, the more fruitful their work will be. How beautiful is that? Put that up on your faculty lounge. And then I said, remember the similarities between this document and Divini. If you remember, Divini talks about, you know, the, the, the child is born into the family, um, but it ultimately, the church has kind of a, a, a it supersedes even the, the jurisdiction that the family would have on the child, but um, being claimed as a supernatural child of God. Um, but then the state also has a part to play in developing um, our, our children, developing young people, developing humans. And so these are our themes that this document will bring up as well. And so again, interesting to maybe even go back in time to your notes on Divini and to see how those two compare, but those three main players that'll influence the, the young person are once again, talked about in this document. Section three, religious dimension of school life and work. And so kind of getting more specific, leaving the school climate behind and saying, and not leaving it behind, but getting more specific within that. So what does the school life look like? And what is the work that's involved there? A school is defined. So the Catholic school um, draws its inspiration and its strength from the gospel in which it is rooted. And that's such a, a beautiful way of saying that our schools are going to do everything else that other schools do. But the thing that separates us is that we will draw our inspiration from the gospel that we are rooted in. Faith enlivens academic pursuits. We might think that faith is something that stands in the way of our academic pursuits and academic excellence. This document is going to argue the opposite to say that when we put faith first, when we focus on this religious dimension, that the academic pursuits will be enlivened. Focusing in on the understanding of the human persons, paragraph 56. But the human person has inherently dignity, greatness, that is elevated to be a child of God, that there's divine origin and eternal destiny, that if that's our concept of the human person, that goodness, that should shape the way that we teach that human person, right? And so again, this formation of a Christian pedagogy is going to be on the way. And then paragraph 63 is going to add to that this supernatural call that all humans have too, that, that God is asking us to do something. There's going to be a focus in on then maybe specific subjects. So history, the humanities, art, literature, music, um, science and technology, religion, and, and again, the religious dimension of all of those. Section four, religious instruction in the classroom and the religious dimension of formation. So if we had this funnel that school culture was up top in section, what was it, two, now we're getting even more specific. So we talked about the school life and, and work in a broad sense. Now we're getting even more specific to religious instruction in the classroom and specifically religious dimension of formation. 
once again, the mission of the church is emphasized that, and I go back to that quote that, that Father Nazi put in the introduction to this book saying that Catholic schools don't have missions, rather the mission has Catholic schools, that our mission is the mission of the church, which is evangelization for interior transformation and the renewal of humanity, that's paragraph 66. The reason for the Catholic schools, the quality of religious instruction integrated into the overall education of the students. And again, you think of that differentiator, it's, it's that we do all that other schools do, but somehow we're animated by the gospel that we're rooted in, that this quality of religious instruction that's integrated into everything that we do really separates us and is that value add that makes us significantly different. Our goals are rooted in Christ and the gospel, paragraph 67. There's going to be a distinction between catechesis and religious instruction. And sometimes we might think that those two things are one and the same. This document is going to separate those two. So just be on the lookout for that. So that way you can kind of see what's the difference between those two understandings of how we form people in their, in their faith. And here it is. So paragraph 71, and, and this is my own take on this. So I could be way off and I apologize if I am, but the introduction of a Christian pedagogy that we're called to accept students as they are, that we're called then to invite them to seek and discover with us the message of the gospel, that we prepare the soil, that we add our own spiritual lives, and then that we pray for our students. And I say this, that this Christian pedagogy, because obviously this is for religious instruction and the religious dimension of formation, but I think it should impact all that we do with our students, that we meet students where, where they are. Think of what Christ did. Christ met people where they were. It didn't matter that they were sinners. It didn't matter that they were on the margins. He went to them and he met them where they were. That's what we're called to do for our students. And then from that, we're, we're to invite them to a different way. We are to, to meet them where they are and then to invite them into a different understanding of life and to a different way of life. And in doing so, we prepare the soil then, that there's that invitation, but then we walk along with them. We journey along with them, Christ with his parables, with his teachings, that, that he was walking alongside of the people that he was calling to this new life. And then your own spiritual life should be added to that, that there's a, a component of witness that if we're going to offer these parables, offer these teachings, but we ourselves are not modeling those, then they're all for nothing. And then this final component, I mean, think of the number of times that Christ prayed for his disciples, to pray for our students. And I say this is a Christian pedagogy because obviously that, that was a component of, of faith development, right? But think about it for any subject, to meet our students where they are. We can't say like, whoa, well, you're two grade levels behind. And so I'm going to kind of just keep my same approach. No, you need to meet them two grade levels behind and then invite them forward right? Invite them to, to continue to, to progress. And so what does that invitation look like? It's individualized, that there is a unique prescription of education for each student that we need to convey and offer to them. And that preparation of the soil, then it's well, what are the unique tactics that we need to use for this individual child? And then how do we need to witness that? How do we need to, again, do that with Christian love and, and charity and patience? And then let's, let's cooperate with divine grace. And, and that phrase comes in a lot in these documents and this one specifically. Let's pray for our students. How powerful is that? This one continued. So this section four continued. An emphasis on scripture, an emphasis on the sacraments, that Jesus Christ is always truly present in the sacraments, which, which he has instituted. And his presence makes them efficacious means of grace, very effective and poignant. Eucharist, reconciliation, the creed, the saints. Mary is talked about multiple times within this document. I think it's beautiful. And in fact, um, in the earlier section on, on the school climate, it says, especially for our younger grades, for our elementary schools, to say we want to create, um, we want to create a home-like atmosphere. And what a great way to do that. Let's have Mary in our classrooms. Mother Mary to be there to guide us, to protect us, to walk alongside us. I mean, she was the first teacher, right, of Jesus, um, and the first, um, the first catechist as well to to bring him up in the faith. And so, um, again, what a wonderful example to have within our our schools and our classrooms. And then paragraphs ninety six and ninety seven. I love this that the religion teacher really should be the best teacher and the best person in the building. 
And that when it, that person is not the best. So maybe we just go with, all right, this person, I couldn't find anybody else and we're going to kind of wing it here. Um, it's actually a detriment to this overall religious dimension. And so, um, you know, to continue to consider how do we as school leaders need to continue to form our teachers? How do we need to provide continued um, opportunities for them to grow in their own faith? And then section five the religious dimension of the formation process as a whole. And so what this section really is, it's a summary. And in looking at then all of what's been talked about, how do you do this? And again, it's, it's a summary of the entire process. Um, that it's an organic set of elements with a single purpose, the gradual development of every capability of every student. Christian pedagogy right there. The gradual development of every capability of every student, enabling each one to attain an integral formation within a context that includes the Christian religious dimension and recognizes the help of grace. There's that cooperation with divine grace. The gospel is once again highlighted students as active participants, that it's not just that we are filling their, their buckets, that they themselves are having a hand in the, in the entire educational process. And then to kind of wrap this up, that the document says, okay, we're laying out a very systematic approach that hits you kind of move in this progression, but the document, the congregation understands though that life though is synthetic, that there's actions and reactions, that there's so many things that are coming together all at the same time, but there's this recognition, this is a beautiful phrase, that our approach has both a horizontal and a vertical dimension. And then the final thing, Harkening back to that idea of praying within the educational environment, pray for your students, invite your students to pray for you. We all need them, need these prayers. And that there's a flow of love in that prayer and that there's also a flow of grace. And so we hope that you enjoyed reading through this document. Again, it's gonna be long, so figure out what's gonna be the best way for you to chunk it and, and get through it. But hopefully this tutorial is helpful and you might wanna do a pause and, and um, I should have said that at the beginning um, through each one and then you can come back to it and watch it or, or back and forth, however might be most helpful. But please be in touch with questions. Continue to cooperate with divine grace to make God known, loved, and served. Thank you for all of your hard work, Remix 16. Good luck, God bless, and go Irish.